It is summer, 1942, and suddenly radio dispatches fly off a tiny remote island deep in the South Pacific. Ominous radio warnings. Coast Watcher Martin Clemens tells of an invasion of Japanese troops. They have begun building an airfield on one of the few flat and dry pieces of ground for thousands of miles, an old coconut plantation on the island of Guadalcanal. Now you're the one that told the Allies about the Japanese building the airfield to start with, correct? Yes. So they would I could look landed. down from where I was, you see, see the whole thing. The messages are flashed to Coast Watch headquarters in Townsville, Australia then relayed to the war room in Washington. Until now, the heavy push was on in Europe to defeat Nazi Germany before turning the attention on the Pacific. Suddenly, the direction of the war changes. As soon as the US High Command found out that the Japanese were building this airfield on Guadalcanal, they knew they had to stop it. That airfield represented a big extension and Japanese force. So Guadalcanal then, this obscure island, becomes the line drawn in the sand. We have to stop them here. Guadalcanal is one of the largest of the 900 islands that make up the Solomon Island chain, just 600 miles northeast of Australia. In the hands of the Japanese, this would be a launch point for bombers to attack Australia. It isn't just a matter of a 1942 threat, it's of a threat that's perceived going back into the decades before 1942. And Australian intelligence officers foreseeing the need for an intelligence tripwire. For years, Australia has feared a sneak attack from the north, prompting the Royal Navy to set up the Coast Watcher Network. The tropical islands to Australia's north had been settled or colonized in the decades before the Second World War. So there was a population of planters and missionaries and officials in that part of the world who could very easily do a second job, that is to say, act as coast watchers. As the war neared, Commander Eric Felt expanded the network, what he called the fence around Australia. It was coordinated from an office building in Townsville, Australia, now an historic landmark. 64 stations went on the air in an arc, stretching 2,500 miles from New Guinea, east to Vanuatu. But it's in the Solomon chain where the most critical posts were positioned. This is Clemens. This is Clemens. Martin Clemens was the district officer on Guadalcanal. He and the other coast watchers began a cat and mouse game with the Japanese, using natives to sneak close to the Japanese camps and spy on them. Michael, they like an aerial now. Daily, the teams set up the radios, stringing antenna lines between trees. They flash a quick message. J-E-R to Ken. Then break it all down quickly, vanishing into the bush, fearful of capture. The Japanese put a lot of effort into hunting down the Coast Watchers. Once that they realized that this network of Coast Watchers was operating and operating effectively around the Pacific, uh, they went to great measures to try and, and winkle these, these people out. You never knew when a Japanese patrol might come looking for you or you'd have to get up in the middle of the night and decamp hurriedly. Day-to-day -day life for a Coast Watcher was a matter of continual terror. If you were left where you were captured, you invariably were executed. New Zealander John Jones was one of the few Coast Watchers captured by the Japanese who survived. It was the, uh, the seventh in Hawaii when I tuned in and uh, Honolulu wasn't on the air. Well, that's very strange. That's how I immediately switched over to LA. The guy there was in hysterics. He, he was screaming his head off about the Japanese and bombed Hawaii. Jones and about 20 other Coast Watchers were planted on tiny atolls in the Gilbert Islands, about 100 miles from a Japanese base. He knew what was coming his way. He and two others were grabbed. We were captured a few hours after Pearl Harbor and immediately taken by the Navy to Japan. Only years later, he learned what happened to the others. Our fellows there put up a monument and he said, I, I always remember the eulogy. <clears throat> and it was, it mentioned all the Coast Watchers. 
uh, they've been beheaded. And I nearly passed out there and I thought, good God, it could only be uh, our fellows and my three good friends. The 17 had been captured, put in a POW camp, and when an American destroyer began shelling the island, they celebrated, expecting to be saved. They did think there was a landing and they were going to be rescued. And they cheered and clapped hands and made uh, quite a bit of noise, which the, the Japanese CO couldn't stand. He ordered the, the killing of all of them immediately. So there was not only the 17 of our Coast Watch, but there was five civilians also beheaded. Back on Guadalcanal, Clemens remains on the run, fearing capture. Working with several hundred natives, he kept an eye on the airstrip, waiting for some sort of response from the Allies. All the time, he was terrified, but dared not show it to the natives. Not showing you were scared stiff to the Solomon Islanders. Did you think at some point you wouldn't make it out? Oh yes, many times. It takes a special kind of person to do what he did. It takes the kind of person who can, who can live alone from civilization and, and, and only have a relationship to the enemy for long stretches of time. We thought we might have to evacuate the camp and go further bush. Thank God we never did. I suppose the atmosphere, you relied on one another and they, they weren't scared, so you wouldn't be scared. They stayed on the move, constantly pushing deeper into the jungle. But the jungle was full of other dangers as well. Deadly bugs, fast rising rivers, unbearable humidity, and almost constant darkness. The landscape is formidable. It's an enemy just by itself. It looks like just a green carpet. You get under there and that's, you're falling over vines, you're tripping over trees, you grab a hole of a tree to pull you up, it just comes apart in your hand because it's rotted. Despite the jungle and the Japanese, the air is electrified by thousands of radio signals as Clemens and the other Coast Watchers track an enemy on the move. None of it is possible without a key weapon, a portable radio transmitter. In the late 30s, with war brewing, the teleradio is developed by Amalgamated Wireless of Australasia. Back then, this was high tech, but they were bulky and heavy. 41 pounds, about 19, 19 and a half kilograms. It wasn't tropic proof, and I think they had problems with humidity up in the islands. Jim Gordon runs the Royal Australian Signals Museum. Mould would go in there, they'd get wet. They probably had to clean them and dry them. The heavy gear had to be hauled through the mountains with a long train of natives. The, the teleradios alone couldn't be carried by two white men plus their equipment. They needed a team to pick up the gear and the batteries. Despite the odds, Clemens and the others pump out a steady Delta stream King. of intel. The most alarming, the strip was nearly finished. It all comes to a head, August 7, 1942. Acting on those Coast Watch dispatches, General Alexander Vandergriff and the U.S. Marines storm ashore on Guadalcanal. The Marines steadily, doggedly enlarge their hold on the island. Guadalcanal, when we landed on Guadalcanal, it was pretty much unopposed. There were mostly construction workers there, and they had backed off kind of into the hills. 17-year-old Lou Imfelt of New Jersey lands with the first wave. And things were quiet uh, for a couple of days. The construction workers retreat so quickly, the Marines are able to seize their heavy machinery and go to work finishing the airstrip, christening it Henderson Field for an American flyer shot down in the Battle of Midway. The invasion of Guadalcanal is a success. But holding it? That will be a whole different story of terrifying battles in the rotting rainforest. United States warships engage the Japanese fleet off the Solomon Islands. The Japanese came from the north. Their main objective, to retake Guadalcanal Island and its strategically important airfield. Almost immediately, the Japanese spring back, launching an air attack within hours, targeting the Marines on the beach 
and their supply ships. The Japanese Navy promptly sinks a number of U.S. ships and drives away the rest of the U.S. fleet. With less than half of their supplies ashore, the Marine Corps, the 1st Marine Division, finds itself abandoned in no man's land. So essentially, they're going to have to hold off the Imperial Japanese Army, which no army has yet done in this war, with one hand tied behind their back. The Japanese begin attacking the beach and supply ships from its base on New Britain, flying bombing runs on Henderson Field. Using aerial bombing and naval gunfire, the plan was to blast the Marines off Guadalcanal. Well, we got bombed every morning and uh, shelled every night. The daylight bombing runs could prove devastating. Once again, it would be up to the Coast Watchers hundreds of miles away to try to even the odds. Could their warnings save the American Marines and the airstrip? 